We are extremely familiar with the first half of Luke chapter 2, the story of Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus and angels and shepherds. We are less familiar with the second half of Luke chapter 2, which tells us what happens just days after Christmas. And these are the days after Christmas. So allow me to read this story to you from our New Testament lesson in Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 21. Now after eight days had passed from the birth of Jesus, it was time to circumcise the child and he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, Mary and Joseph brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Every firstborn according to the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And guided by the Spirit, Simeon came to the temple And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. And at that moment she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth, And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And on the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, He was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. Every time a baby is born and every time they receive their name and every time they're dedicated in the church, we know it's a new beginning. Uh, Wrapped in those christening gowns when people bring them for the dedication here are bundles of hope for the future of that family, for the future of the church, for the future of the world seven, eight, nine, ten plus pounds of possibility. The birth of every new year has a sense of possibility to it. So it's kind of nice that the naming of Jesus and the beginning of the new year fall together on the Christian calendar. And this morning I want us to dissect and to listen closely to every part of Luke chapter 2 verse 21 and hear the possibilities that are being named for the new year. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel gave him before he was conceived. When I read that verse, I know that possible for the new year, something new is about to happen. On the eighth day, on the eighth day, The eighth day is a Jewish phrase that really serves as a symbol or a way of saying that a new chapter is beginning. It's the Jewish culture that gave us a seven-day week. We wouldn't have a seven-day week if it wasn't for Judaism. And the phrase eighth day means something new, a new chapter, a new week is about to begin. It's a symbol of newness. 
Very much like that ball drop in Times Square on New Year's Eve, you know after that something new is about to begin. You know they drop other things in other places on New Year's Eve? Yeah, in Atlanta, they drop a peach on New Year's Eve. Those of you who are from South Carolina probably know that on Hilton Head Island, they drop a golf ball on New Year's Eve. Orange County, Florida, they drop an orange on New Year's Eve. Hershey, Pennsylvania, a huge chocolate kiss on New Year's Eve. Wisconsin, an 80-pound wedge of cheese on New Year's Eve. Fayetteville, Arkansas, the state where I grew up, they actually drop a live hog on New Year's Eve. <laughs> Don't laugh, not too far from us, just up the road in Brasstown, North Carolina, they drop a possum in a plexiglass pyramid on New Year's Eve. <laughs> PETA ought to be having a field day with these last two. But my favorite, in Mobile, Alabama, anybody from Alabama? Anybody watch the game last night? In Mobile, Alabama, they drop an 800-pound electrically lit moon pie on New Year's Eve. <laughs> the eighth day, it's a symbol of something new, that a new chapter is about to begin. And no matter how hard or how long 2018 seemed, 2019 is going to be wide open and filled with possibility. The eighth day is a symbol of hope, kind of like an 800-pound electric moon pie or a possum in a plexiglass pyramid, if that makes any sense at all. On the eighth day. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child. Not only will 2019 hold something new, but something old is also about to happen. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child. The church offices are going to be closed on January the 1st. It's Tuesday. We will all come back to work on January the 2nd, and I'll be greeting my colleagues in the hallway the way I've greeted them every January the 2nd for the last five years. I always say the same thing. Okay, let's do it all over again. Because so much of what we do every year, we have done before. Uh, my new year is going to begin, and I know that that means there are going to be sermons to be written and visits to be made and calendars to be set and worship services to be planned and a budget to be raised. And so the message at the beginning of the new year is, okay, let's do it all again. Now, on our worst days, we could go all Ecclesiastes, couldn't we? Didn't you just love that uplifting passage that Frank read for us a moment ago? The writer of the Ecclesiastes got so depressed about the repetitive nature of our existence. And so if you were listening close, you heard those words, everything is vanity. A generation goes and a generation comes. The sun rises and the sun goes down and it hurries back to the place where it rises. All things are wearisome. What has been is what will be. What has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which you can say this is new? No, it's already been in the ages before us. I have seen all the deeds that are done under the sun, and all is vanity. It's just chasing after the wind. On our worst days, we could go all Ecclesiastes, couldn't we? And we could resent the repetitive nature of life. We could relegate the rituals of our faith and the rituals of our life to meaninglessness and just set them aside and say, I'm tired of them. But Mary and Joseph... When it came time to circumcise the child, a religious ritual as old as Judaism itself, they understood the importance of the ritual. In fact, the whole text that follows, verse after verse after verse, has to do with the circumcision of the child and the naming of the child and the purification of the parents and the sacrifice of thanksgiving and the attention given. It's, it's ritual after ritual. It's the same thing over and over again that people have been doing with great meaning. We recently had a visitor to our church. It was about three months ago. She told me she had left the Baptist church, in fact, had left religion altogether, but was invited to, to visit here. She had left it because she was hurt and felt like church wasn't worth it anymore, and she had been gone for years. But she came to that worship service, a worship service where we both celebrated baptism and communion at the same service. She was telling me in the narthex she teared up during the baptism, and her hand was shaking so bad she could barely get the cup of juice to her lips during communion. 
She said, by the end of the doxology, I could hardly breathe. I was crying so hard. And then she said, I have missed the rituals of the faith. On our worst days, we could go all Ecclesiastes and say, I'm tired of doing the same thing over and over again. But on our best days, on our best days, we embrace the beauty of ritual and routine. We are happy to be alive another year. We are happy to be in worship one more Sunday, happy to celebrate one more Christmas and one more Easter, happy to get up and enjoy the morning cup of coffee in that same chair, in that same room, or on that same porch that we enjoy a cup of coffee every morning, happy to walk in Barnes & Noble and see Connie and Jolene. They're always there. Happy to make that familiar drive to work every day on the same roads. Happy to take that daily walk in the neighborhood. Happy to get that weekly call from a child or a grandchild. Happy to watch that favorite television show on a Tuesday. You get the sense? It's all old and it's all familiar. And in ways we seldom contemplate, it's all meaningful and powerful in our lives. Something old. In fact, lots of things old are going to happen in 2019. On the eighth day, something new. When it was time to circumcise the child, something old. He was named Jesus. Something difficult is going to happen in 2019. Do you remember the Johnny Cash song, A Boy Named Sue? Okay, those of you who are over 50, do you remember the Johnny Cash song, A Boy Named Sue? Yeah, it was, a, it was about a dad who named his son Sue, and the, the poor boy grew up having to fight his way through life, everybody making fun of him, but it was that name that made him tough. Now, I don't have time to sing it right now, but I'll happy, be happy to do that for you later on. We, we'll go through the whole song. They named him Jesus. Jesus should have been named Jesus Bar Joseph, or Jesus Ben Joseph, which would have meant Jesus, son of Joseph. In the Middle Eastern countries, you typically name your son or your child by a given name, Jesus, and then rather than a last name, it's just son of the father's name, Jesus, son of Joseph. But they just named him Jesus because, well, they weren't sure who his father was. That was hard enough. By the time we get to the Gospels in Mark chapter 6, people have been called, become, began calling him Jesus, son of Mary. To attach a mother's name to a child's name is to blatantly call a child a bastard. We don't know who your father is, so we're going to call you Jesus, son of Mary. It's subtle, but in verse 21 it just says he was named Jesus. And you know there are going to be some hard days ahead. We're going to have some hard days in 2019. Lydia Kay, a wonderful author and psychologist, says there are six inevitabilities that we all face every year. Conflict, if you live in human community. Failure. Loss of some sort. Struggle with personal weaknesses, whether they are personal or, I mean, physical or mental. Aging, our own and the aging of others. And death, either our own or the death of others. Some of our struggles will be a part or the result of our own choices. Some of our struggles are going to be the result of someone else's choices. Most of our struggles are just going to be factors out of our control. But we need to understand that the difficulties of life are not anomalies. They are to be expected. And God is to be trusted through them because they named him Jesus. And he knows about hard days. But finally, the new year provides a possibility that something holy is going to happen. On the eighth day, something new. When it was time to circumcise the child, something old. They named him Jesus, something difficult. The name the angel had given them, something very holy. In many, many Semitic, Semitic regions like Israel and Jordan, Lebanon, and even Turkey, 
It's a tradition that family members and friends offer up names for newborn child, and the parents get to choose which name they want to name the child. I'm not sure if Mary and Joseph's friends did or didn't, considering the circumstances of the pregnancy, but they had felt the nudge of God from an angel. An angel had said, name the baby Jesus, and they followed that spiritual nudge and named the baby Jesus. The holy will happen in 2019 if we are attentive to and follow those spiritual nudges in our life. I know that sometimes I frustrate you. I know that I do. More than once, people have come to me sensing a need in their life and saying, you know, Jim, the church should start a program or we should form a committee or the church staff should give attention to. And here's the point at which I frustrate you. I know it frustrates you. My typical response is, well, if God has put this in your heart, you ought to go do it and make it happen. It's not a facetious or a sarcastic response. But the work of the church really isn't to sit around and think up programs and create committees and get more things for staff to do, but it's to provide worship and educational opportunities so that you can come and sit and dream and be inspired and listen for the nudges of God so that you can go into the world and be the church in the world based on those holy nudges in your life. Does that make sense? I'm given a lot of food at Christmas, and this year throat lozenges. Please stop. <laughs> yeah. I'm given a lot of food at Christmas. One year when we were living in Macon, we had all the, the food and the snacks and the candy and the cakes and everything that had been given to the family for Christmas piled up on the table. And one of my younger daughters says, why didn't the church just give all this to the homeless instead of us? Why didn't the church do something? My oldest daughter said, why don't we give it to the homeless? And following the holy nudge, we bagged that stuff up in separate bags. And on Christmas Day, my daughters and I went to the Spring Street Bridge where the homeless folk hang out in Macon. And we had a party under the bridge, people getting bags of food and enjoying the gift. I'll tell you what happened to me this Christmas Day. Now, I was running downtown here in Greenville, and you know all the statues downtown of all these wonderful founding fathers? Uh, I, was, I was running downtown, and every one of the statues had a knit cap and a scarf wrapped around it. Did anybody else see this? Had a knit cap and a scarf on them, and I was kind of laughing at the first couple, and by the time I got down to where the Weston is and, and the statues down there, I walked over and saw there was a piece of paper pinned to it, and the note on every scarf and every hat said, this is not a lost item. If you are cold, please take it and have a Merry Christmas. I doubt that was a committee or a program. I imagine some people felt a holy nudge and just did what the Spirit of God was moving them to do. Later in the day, I received a text from a friend. Some of you probably received the same text. that said, I was going through my list of contacts on my phone today and decided to remember and pray for you. That wasn't a committee, and that wasn't a program. It was just one person that got a holy nudge and did something holy. Christmas Day, a friend of mine called me from Georgia. I asked her what she was doing for Christmas, and she said, oh, I'm going to spend the day with my sister. I said, I didn't think you and your sister had been talking for like 10 years. She said, well, I just decided yesterday to call her, and she was glad I did. And we decided that it was silly what we'd been fussing about and we needed to spend some time together. It's just a holy nudge. The naming of a new child, the start of a new year, seven, eight, nine, ten pounds plus a possibility or 365 days of possibility. Something new and something old and something difficult and something holy is going to happen in 2019. May God go with us through the year. Let's pray together. Loving God, this day has been a gift from you, and we are grateful for it. Every day that we are given ahead of us will be gifts from you. Know now that we are grateful. And may we embrace, embrace every stranger that comes to our door during these days, every visitor, whether it's difficult, easy, old, or new. 
And may you continually nudge us to do that which is holy in your world. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.